The course that Lehi and his company traveled from Jerusalem to the place of their destination, they traveled nearly a south, southeast direction until they came to the 19th degree of north latitude, then, nearly east to the Sea of Arabia, then sailed in a southeast direction, and landed on the continent of South America, in Chile, 30 degrees south latitude. Joseph Smith Hi, I'm Dan Vogel. The preceding statement was published in 1882 by Apostle Franklin D. Richards and James A. Little in their second edition of their small book called Compendium of the Doctrines of the Gospel which was intended as an aid for missionary work. They introduced it as Lehi's Travels, Revelation to Joseph the Seer. Obviously, a Chilean landing for Lehi's party fits traditional hemispheric geography, but creates problems for any geography that tries to limit Book of Mormon events to Central or North America. Those who advocate what is called a heartland theory or the Isthmus of Teowanapec theory, either ignore or dismiss their own church's tradition regarding the location of Lehi's landing. As I will discuss, there are two surviving document sources for the statement about Lehi's travels, neither of which includes the identifying heading, Revelation to Joseph the Seer. This situation has caused several positions to be taken regarding the origin of the statement. 1. The tradition regarding Joseph Smith's inspired authorship is correct. 2. Joseph Smith authored the statement, but its purported revelatory status is questionable. And 3. Frederick G. Williams, Smith's scribe, is the real author of the statement, which may or may not be inspired. In this video, I will discuss the manuscript sources for Lehi's travels in detail and the tradition of Lehi's landing in Chile or South America. I will also examine the motives and arguments of those who have attempted to escape its implications. As mentioned, there are presently two document sources for Lehi's travels, neither of which is the original. The earliest copy was made by Joseph Smith's scribe, Frederick G. Williams, which remained in the Williams family after Frederick's death on the 10th of October, 1842, until the 11th of April, 1864, when it was presented to the historians of the LDS Church by Ezra G. Williams, Frederick's son. The document is presently in the LDS Church archives in the Joseph Smith Revelations collection and is available for viewing on the Church History Library website under Section 7. Williams did not date this document, but he apparently made it sometime between November 1830 when he joined the Church and the 7th of November 1837 when he was removed from his office as counselor to Joseph Smith in the presidency for disciplinary reasons. However, it may be possible to narrow the date further. Lehi's Travels appears on a single sheet of paper with nine other items, which give clues as to the probable date of its composition. These items are a revelation concerning John, the beloved disciple, questions asked in English and answered in Hebrew, characters on the Book of Mormon, the course that Lehi traveled, strange characters, a name and address later lined out, two phrases of unknown meaning and two English phrases, mathematical calculations in pencil, a statement of Ezra G. Williams, Frederick's son, dated 11th of April, 1864, in red ink, and the word revelation in pencil. What follows is a description and examination of each of these items. The first item is a copy of a revelation Joseph Smith dictated in April 1829 in response to a dispute between him and Oliver Cowdery, his principal scribe, 
regarding the meaning of John 21, verses 20-24, through 24, which mentions the Apostle John tearing on earth until Jesus returns. Not a problem until Jesus failed to return quickly. Smith evidently believed John had at some point become immortal and was still ministering on earth. Most commentators, and Cowdery may have been advocating this interpretation, emphasize the hypothetical or hyperbolic nature of Jesus' words to Peter. If I will that he, John, tarry till I come, what is that to thee? The revelation, now published as section 7 of the Doctrine and Covenants, settled the dispute, predictably in Joseph Smith's favor. Joseph Smith later worked the answer into his dictation of 3 Nephi 28, when Jesus granted the same power to three of the twelve Nephite disciples. According to an introductory heading that was included when first published in 1833 in the Book of Commandments, the revelation was translated from parchment, written and hidden up by himself, referring to the Apostle John. Presumably, Smith claimed to have seen this ancient document, along with its translation, in his seer stone. Comparison of the text on the Williams document with other versions of the Revelation suggests that Williams copied the Revelation from an early manuscript source rather than from the 1833 Book of Commandments or 1835 Doctrine and Covenants. Most notably, the Williams copy does not include the revisions of the 1835 Doctrine and Covenants. Comparison of the Williams copy of the Revelation with the 1833 Book of Commandments suggests that it was not copied from this source either. The body of the text includes differences in punctuation, capitalization, and wording. If Williams had copied the Revelation from the Book of Commandments, it is likely that his heading would be the same. The variant reading of the first half in the Williams copy is the earliest reading. In Manuscript Revelations Book 1, page 14, Hath is cancelled and Has is inserted above the line in Sidney Riggins' handwriting. The second Hath, instead of both, is unique to Williams, suggesting that either Williams or his source misread both as Hath. The next two items have a single source. Questions asked in English and answered in Hebrew. Under this heading is a quote from Jacob 5, verse 13. For it grieveth me that I should lose this tree and the fruit thereof. The following line reads something like, Answer, Often zimim isman e zu oms ifs veris itsen in zvanis veneris. Under this undecipherable phrase is another quote, apparently from Jacob 7:27 though reading slightly different. English, brethren, I bid you adieu. Neither the printer's manuscript nor the 1830 Book of Mormon includes the words, I bid you. And finally, another undecipherable phrase. Answer, ifs e zamtri. After drawing a separating line, Williams wrote, Characters on the Book of Mormon. Under this heading, on the left side of the page, is written, the Book of Mormon, under which appear two unique characters. To the right of this is written, the Interpreters of Languages, under which appear two more unique characters. None of these characters appear in the well-known Anthon transcript of Book of Mormon characters. There is little doubt that Williams copied this from an undated document that was written and kept for profit and learning by Oliver Cowdery which is presently in the LDS Church History Library. Williams apparently misread a loop in Cowdery's curly bracket as an O, causing him to write often instead of fin as the first word of the first transliterated Hebrew phrase. In copying Cowdery's document, Williams added two headings, questions asked in English and answered in Hebrew, and characters on the Book of Mormon, as well as the two answer labels. Cowdery had instead identified the four phrases with alternating English and Hebrew labels, which gives the impression that the English is a translation of the Hebrew, rather than the Hebrew being an answer to the English quote, which is not a question at all. 
The file notation on the reverse of Cowdery's document, Questions Answered in Hebrew, provides additional evidence that Williams had access to this very document. Because, as my longtime friend and colleague Brent Medcalf points out, it not only reflects Williams' mischaracterization of Cowdery's document, but it also turns out to be Williams' handwriting. These phrases, labeled Hebrew, are contrived and have more affinity with Latin than Hebrew. Matthew Gray, an associate professor of ancient scripture at BYU, has observed, Obviously, these transliterated texts do not contain any recognizable Hebrew words and do not represent Hebrew in any traditional sense. Edward H. Ashmont, who was a doctoral candidate in Egyptology at the University of Chicago and formerly served as supervisor of scripture translation research for the LDS Church, concluded that because the transliterated text bears no resemblance to Hebrew at all, the Cowdery and Williams documents date prior to January 1836, when Smith began his formal study of Hebrew. Ashment even provided a chart comparing the Williams Cowdery transliteration with an actual Hebrew transliteration of the Book of Mormon phrases. So, what is the source of the contrived Hebrew? The quotes from the Book of Jacob came near the end of Joseph Smith's dictation in the Book of Mormon in June 1829 in the small plates of Nephi, which Nephi began with his explanation that he wrote in the language of my father, which consists of the learning of the Jews and the language of the Egyptians. So Nephi's record would have been engraved in Egyptian script, or reformed Egyptian, as Mormon had previously explained, similar to the four characters on Cowdery's document. But the characters would have represented Hebrew sounds, or reformed Hebrew sounds, like Cowdery's transliterated text. So the contrived Hebrew could have been supplied by Smith near the end of the translation at the Whitmer home in Fayette as a sample of the Nephites' spoken language, possibly through the gift of tongues. The four characters that follow the Hebrew transliteration do not seem to directly relate to the preceding text. The first two might represent a kind of shorthand for Book of Mormon. The last two characters are oddly similar. Both have a horizontal line over two dots towards the right end, and at the opposite end, superimposed circular shapes resembling O and C. Curiously, the initials of Oliver Cowdery. They possibly represent the two stones of the Nephite interpreters, which were set in the rims of two bows of silver. The last item on the front of the page is the statement about Lehi's travels, which reads, The course that Lehi traveled from the city of Jerusalem to the place where he and his family took ship. They traveled nearly a south-southeast direction until they came to the 19th degree of north latitude, then nearly east to the Sea of Arabia, then sailed in a southeast direction and landed on the continent of South America in Chile, 30 degrees south latitude. The source from which Williams copied this statement is apparently no longer extant. A comparison with the 1882 publication shows that Richards and Little apparently reworded the introductory phrase, adjusted punctuation, and corrected spelling, although they may have used the second nearly identical copy of Lehi's Travels to be discussed later. Richards and Little also added the heading, Revelation to Joseph the Seer. How else could one know the exact latitudes in Lehi's journey, if not by revelation? Who else could make such a statement besides Joseph Smith? The reasons for Richards and Little believing such was the case will be discussed in detail later. Before I describe the items that appear on the back of the Williams document, which were apparently added later, I will discuss the probable date of the Lehi's Travels statement. This is important because, as we will see, some have asserted that this is a revelation to Frederick G. Williams during the dedication of the Kirtland Temple in March 1836. Because both the ink and the handwriting is consistent, 
or rather, because there is neither a change in ink, nor an unevenness or inconsistency in the handwriting, one is led to conclude that all four items on the front of the document were copied at or near the same time. So if one concludes that the first item, the April 1829 revelation concerning the Apostle John, was probably copied prior to its 1833 publication, then most likely Lehi's Travels was also copied before that date. The unifying theme of these four items is the Book of Mormon, things that the early church, especially missionaries, would have found interesting or important about the book they were preaching about. The first three items relate to Cowdery in some way. The first item was dictated in April 1829 to settle a dispute between Smith and Cowdery concerning the fate of the Apostle John, which showed up later in Third Nephi. The next two items Williams copied from a paper in Cowdery's handwriting. The last item, Lehi's Travels, also relates to Cowdery, because he was apparently the first to publicly state that Lehi landed in Chile. When Oliver Cowdery, Harley P. Pratt, Peter Whitmer Jr., and Ziba Peterson arrived in the Kirtland area in late October 1830, they began preaching the Book of Mormon. On the 18th of November 1830, Ohio's Observer and Telegraph reported that Cowdery gave a public address in which he related Joseph Smith's discovery of the gold plates and gave an outline of the Book of Mormon's contents, including the information that Lehi's party landed on the coast of Chile 600 years before the coming of Christ, and from them descended all the Indians of America. It seems probable that the Lehi's travel statement was behind Cowdery's unequivocal declaration. One of Cowdery's converts was none other than Frederick G. Williams, who was baptized probably in early November. Williams was invited to accompany the four missionaries to Missouri, which he accepted and furnished them with provisions, funds, and a horse. For the next ten months, Williams lived in Independence, Missouri, with Cowdery and the others. It seems probable that during this time, Williams copied the four items from the papers Cowdery was carrying with him. This is a far more likely scenario than the theory that Williams authored Lehi's Travels in March 1836. This will become more apparent as I proceed. The first thing to notice about the verso or back of the Williams document, besides the array of strange looking characters, is how this 12 and 3 fourths by 8 inch sheet of fool's cap paper was folded. There are two vertical and seven horizontal folds. The red line is a half fold, the purpose of which will be explained. There are also two areas of discoloration, evidence that they were on the outside of the folded packet, and that Williams carried this sheet on his person for an unknown period of time. Two methods of folding are apparent. First, Williams folded the sheet in a typical letter fashion. The approximately three-fourths of an inch fold at the bottom of the page was intended as a flap into which one end of the letter when folded was inserted to form the envelope. This is called the tuck and seal method because the flap is where the wax seal, usually red, was affixed. In this photo, I am using a replica of the Williams document in its completed form. The first folding occurred before there was any writing on the back. There are various ways to fold a 19th century letter, but it appears that the sheet was first folded into thirds lengthwise. Then it was folded in half, minus the flap, then into thirds. Finally, the end of the folded sheet was tucked into the flap, forming a small, secure packet. Wax would be added under the flap and on top, and then a small metal stamp applied to the hot wax to form an impression. Folding the sheet in this manner would not explain the staining patterns, however. The staining pattern tells us how Williams refolded the sheet. 
that it was folded differently than originally intended. The darkest staining appears in the second fold from the top. Note that the first third is only partly stained, indicating that it was tucked into the other end. There is no way to fold the sheet to get the two stained segments on opposite sides without Williams adding another half fold in the second to last panel. Williams must have had a reason for doing this, but it eludes me. For a time, the three parts of the inside cover remained blank until Williams used them to jot down some notes and mathematical calculations. These jottings and staining patterns indicate that he carried the document somewhere on his person, possibly in a pocket or billfold or perhaps even his Book of Mormon. At some point, after copying the items on the front, Williams added 89 strange characters arranged in 12 lines of 7 groupings divided by horizontal lines. Overall, the Williams character seems stylistically different than either the Anton transcript or the four Cowdery characters. And, like the Anton transcript and Cowdery characters, Williams' characters also seem contrived. See my videos on the Book of Mormon characters. Naturally, some have wondered if the Williams characters might represent more of the characters Joseph Smith prepared in association with Martin Harris's seeking learned opinion in early 1828, although some Williams family members have expressed their belief that they were revealed to Frederick by an angel at the 27th of March 1836 dedication of the Kirtland Temple, which is highly unlikely. I will discuss this claim shortly. A possible clue to the origin of at least some of the characters is found in two crossed-out headings. The second group of characters includes a crossed-out heading, a silver trunk, while the third group is arranged under the crossed-out heading, an iron chest. This seems to suggest that the characters were copied from the outside surface of a trunk and chest. It does not seem likely that the silver trunk refers to a trunk made of silver, but probably refers to a trunk or strong box for securing silver like this 19th century English oak and iron bound silver chest, or this 18th century French oak and iron bound silver chest. Similarly, the iron chest could refer to a cast iron chest like this 17th century French cast iron strong box or this 17th century German iron and iron bound strong box, or this 17th century English iron bound chest. One might suggest that Williams or someone else very poorly copied the characters from a real trunk and chest, but this doesn't seem likely given the artificial quality of the characters. Another possibility is that Williams or someone else, like Joseph Smith, saw them in a vision, possibly in association with treasure searching. The late historian D. Michael Quinn documented the use of seer stones and treasure searching among Mormons in the Kirtland, Ohio area in the 1830s. Interestingly, in 1855, Brigham Young said that while Oliver Cowdery had Joseph Smith's brown seer stone, Dr. Williams had Smith's second seer stone. Perhaps Williams believed the trunk and chest bearing these characters contained Nephite treasures that had become slippery, as mentioned in Helaman 13. At the bottom left side of the page, Williams wrote, Reuben Cooley, Michigan, Kalamazoo County, Prairie Ronde. Williams evidently spelled rond phonetically, as it is pronounced without an e, and means round in French. Prairie Rond was the location for the post office for Kalamazoo County. 
Reuben Cooley Sr. does not appear in the 1830 census of Kalamazoo County, but rather in the census of Leroy, Genesee County, New York. By July 1833, he had located in Portage Township, Kalamazoo County, where he purchased 40 acres of land. Two years later, Cooley died on the 13th of April, 1835, several months before Williams accompanied Joseph Smith and others to Pontiac, Oakland County, Michigan, which is located several counties northeast of Kalamazoo County. However, it is possible that the Reuben Cooley on the Williams document refers to Reuben Cooley Jr., who may have moved to Prairie Round from Leroy with his father prior to moving to the Kirtland area. Williams' account book for 1837 to 1842 has an entry transferring Cooley's account from another account book dating to 1836. Cooley was also assessed for property tax, two horses and one cow in Kirtland for 1836 and 1837. It is also possible that Reuben Jr. gave Williams his father's address prior to his trip to Michigan in August 1835. Either way, it tends to date the Williams note before 1835 or 36. At the bottom of the page in the middle is written upside down four lines of text of what appears to be two alternating lines of a foreign language and two lines in English. It reads something like, Imash mish shown. Is it as well with you as it is with me? And shine ha mish shown. It is as well with me as it is with you. This doesn't appear to be Hebrew, as on the front, it might have been intended as either Reformed Hebrew or the Adamic language. In an 1838 revelation, the words Shinha will be identified as Adamic and associated with the mountains of Adamon Diamond and the plains of Olaha Shinha, or the land where Adam dwelt. Prior to that, Shinha appeared as a code name for Kirtland in the 1835 Doctrine and Covenants. In 1842, Joseph Smith used Shinha to refer to the sun in Abraham 3, verse 13. It may be that the Williams document is the earliest appearance of Shinha. In the third fold are some numbers quickly scribbled sideways in pencil, which appear to be mathematical calculations. These numbers are difficult to read. Finally, there is a signed statement written sideways near the right edge of the paper in red ink, which reads, Great Salt Lake City, April 11, 1864. This paper is in the handwriting of my father, Fred G. Williams. The characters thereon I believe to be a representation of those shown him at the dedication of the Kirtland Temple. Ezra G. Williams this no doubt alludes to the account in the 27th of March, 1836 minutes of the temple's dedication that mentions that Frederick G. Williams bore record that a holy angel of God came and sat between him and Joseph Smith Sr. while the house was being dedicated. Note that other than identifying his father's handwriting, Ezra says nothing about the source of the four items on the front. This is an important point because members of the Williams family will later mistakenly assign Lehi's travels to Frederick G. Williams' 1836 vision in the temple, rather than to Joseph Smith. Note also that Ezra only states that it is his opinion that the characters on the back represent those shown to his father during the dedication of the temple, not that his father told him the meaning of the characters. Although, crossed out, the identification of a silver trunk and an iron chest imply a different source. Ezra was 18 when his father died on the 10th of October, 1842. He evidently didn't know the meaning of the origin of the paper he inherited when his mother, Rebecca Swain Williams, subsequently died on the 25th of September, 1861. There is no reason to credit Ezra's belief about the characters, or to conclude his father's vision of the angel was anything more than an appearance. 
In 1864, Ezra was living and farming in North Ogden, later Pleasant View, Utah. He subsequently moved to Ogden and began practicing medicine. He may have been visiting Salt Lake City for General Conference, which ended on Sunday, the 10th of April. On the following day, before returning to Ogden, he endorsed the back of the Lehigh's travel statement. At this time, George A. Smith was church historian, and Wilford Woodruff was assistant historian. According to his journal, Wilford Woodruff was not in the office on this day. Robert L. Campbell kept the office journal but didn't record the transaction with Ezra Williams, possibly because it was made directly with George A. in his office. Also in pencil is the word revelation, written sideways along the right edge of the page, just above the statement of Ezra G. Williams, which is neither the handwriting of Frederick G. Williams nor his son Ezra. This was likely added by a clerk in the historian's office in 1864 or sometime thereafter, apparently as clarification of Ezra's statement that the characters were shown supernaturally to his father at the dedication. In 1951, Nancy Williams, plural wife of Frederick G. Williams II, son of Ezra Williams, published a photograph of the Williams document, along with her unfounded and unhistorical speculations about Lehigh's travels. When she was shown a microfilm of the document, she said she received with others a wonderful manifestation that it was indeed a revelation given to Frederick G. Williams for him and his family. This, of course, carries no historical weight whatsoever, which makes it all the more astounding that some LDS scholars have followed Nancy's personal belief. In his 1985 book, An Ancient American Setting for the Book of Mormon, Brigham Young University professor John L. Sorensen, who is one of the foremost promoters of what is known as the limited Teowanapek theory of Book of Mormon geography, questioned Joseph Smith's authorship of Lehigh's Travels based on Nancy Williams. Sorensen went so far as to claim that Frederick G. Williams later claimed that the statement about Chile was made to him by an angel rather than by Joseph Smith. This is not true, for Frederick made no such claim. Nancy's experience in the historian's office in 1949 may have been spiritual confirmation to something she had heard her mother-in-law, Henrietta E. Williams, wife of Ezra G. Williams, say previous to her death on the 11th of June, 1922. Eight years after her husband's death, Henrietta made a statement on the 24th of January, 1913, regarding Lehigh's travels. In an unused section of Frederick's 1837 account book, Merlin J. Stone, who was an avid genealogist living in Ogden, inserted the following statement. Note, the following revelation was received by Frederick Granger Williams at the dedication of the Kirtland Temple concerning Lehigh's travels. Then follows the text of Lehigh's travels copied from the 1882 compendium. F.G. Williams claimed that at the time of the receiving of the revelation that an angel appeared to him and sat between F.G. Williams and Joseph Smith Sr. F.G. Williams then transcribed the message on paper which he kept during his lifetime, and Mrs. Williams kept this paper sacred until her demise. It then came into the possession of Dr. E. G. Williams, who loaned it to Apostle George A. Smith, and Mr. and Mrs. Williams since tried several times to secure the manuscript again, but were unsuccessful. This revelation later appeared in print in the compendium, page 289, and was erroneously accredited to Joseph Smith the prophet from an interview with Mrs. Henrietta E. Williams, wife of Dr. E. G. Williams at Ogden, Utah, January 24, 1913. Signed, Merlin J. Stone. The entry itself is undated, but it was undoubtedly written sometime shortly after Stone interviewed the 86-year-old Mrs. Williams on the 24th of January, 1913. In 1864, Ezra Williams had said nothing about Lehigh's travels, stating only that he believed the characters on the back were shown to his father during the temple's dedication. 
If the Williams family believed Frederick had authored Lehi's travels, why didn't Ezra protest in 1882, when Richards and Little mistakenly attributed it to Joseph Smith? The Richards Little compendium went through five editions before Ezra died in 1905. Sorensen referred to a statement attributed to Joseph Smith that seems to contradict Lehi's travels. The statement, which appeared in the Mormon newspaper Times and Seasons on the 15th of September, 1842, during Joseph Smith's editorship, reads, Lehi went down by the Red Sea to the great southern ocean and crossed over to this land and landed a little south of the Isthmus of Darien and improved the country according to the word of the Lord. Sorensen argued that this statement shows an evolution in Joseph Smith's thinking about Book of Mormon geography because it locates Lehi's Landing about 3,000 miles north of the point in Chile mentioned in the Williams Note. Apologist Kevin Christensen similarly argued in 1990 that the Times and Seasons statement is contradictory to the Chile designation. While it is not altogether certain that Joseph Smith authored the above editorial comment, it is apparent that the apologetic reading is too literal. The entirety of the statement makes it clear that the editor was not being precise about history or geography. Indeed, the statement that Lehi landed a little south of Darien and improved the country is not accurate. Lehi died long before any improvements were made a little south of the narrow neck of land. Following Lehi's death, Nephi and his people traveled northward and built a temple in the city of Nephi, which the Nephites eventually abandoned 200 years later, to move yet again to the land of Zarahemla, located just below the narrow neck of land. This geographic area became the heart of Nephite culture and civilization. I will return to this and other arguments against Lehi's travels near the end of this video. One other early manuscript copy of Lehi's travels exists. Before leaving Nauvoo, Illinois, in 1845, Mormon physician John M. Bernheisel visited Emma Smith, the prophet's widow, to borrow the manuscript of Joseph Smith's Bible revision. After making a partial copy of this manuscript, Bernheisel added Lehi's travels to the last sheet, or second to the last page. It is uncertain when church authorities came into possession of Bernheisel's manuscript, but L. John Nuttall, private secretary to President John Taylor, had custody of it in August 1879. His handwriting and initials appear on the cover of the manuscript. Nuttall recorded in his journal that he received the manuscript from President Taylor, keeping possession of it until he turned it over to the church historian's office in 1903. Note the differences in capitalization and spelling between the Bernheisel and Williams copies. Robert J. Matthews, formerly Dean of Religious Education at BYU, and at the time of his death in 2009, an authority on Joseph Smith's Bible revision, reported that the penmanship of the Lehi entry appears to be consistent with the remainder of the manuscript, having the same style of writing, capitalization, and word slant. In every respect, it seems to be the handwriting of Dr. Bernheisel recorded during the May-June 1845 period. Unfortunately, Bernheisel also failed to give a source or attribution for the Lehigh Statement, but as with the Williams document, its inclusion with other inspired writings of Joseph Smith tends to support early church tradition. Since the original Bible revision manuscript in possession of the community of Christ does not include the statement about Lehigh, Researchers have wondered about Bernheisel's source. Frederick G. Williams III initially suggested that Bernheisel's source appears to be the Williams document, since Bernheisel's copy has the identical wording and nearly the same spelling, capitalization, and punctuation as the Williams copy, with both misspelling the word latitude. The situation is not that simple, however. Latitude, with two T's, was a common spelling in the 19th century, and Bernheisel otherwise corrected the spelling in the statement, including Chile with an E. Perhaps realizing the weakness of his argument, Mr. Williams subsequently modified his position, 
stating that although we do not know how Dr. Bernheisel obtained the Lehi's travel statement, it has the same wording and nearly the same spelling, capitalization, and punctuation as the Williams copy, with both men misspelling the word latitude. This correlation suggests that Bernheisel copied the Frederick G. Williams document, or that the two had an unknown third common source. But did Bernheisel have access to the Williams document? In May-June 1845, it would have been in possession of Rebecca Swain Williams, wife of Frederick G. Williams. According to Nancy Williams, Rebecca and her son lived in the Nauvoo Mansion House after Frederick's death in 1842. This is incorrect. Ezra and his mother remained in Quincy, Illinois, located about 47 miles south of Nauvoo, where Frederick had practiced medicine before his death. Ezra opened a practice of his own in Quincy with his brother-in-law, Burr Riggs. It therefore seems unlikely that Bernheisel copied Lehi's travels from the Williams document, which means Williams and Bernheisel copied from a now-lost original. It makes little sense for Bernheisel to copy a text he knew originated with Frederick G. Williams into a record containing the inspired writings of Joseph Smith, without indicating different authorship. It therefore follows that even if Bernheisel had somehow copied Lehi's travels from the Williams document, it would only make sense for him to add it to his Bible revision manuscript if he had been made to understand by Rebecca it was another inspired text originating with Joseph Smith. While the church had the Bernheisel copy since at least 1879 and the Williams copy since 1864, the text of Lehi's travels remained unpublished until 1882 when it appeared in the Richard's Little Compendium. However, the designation of Chile as the place of Lehi's landing was a strong Mormon tradition long before publication of Lehi's travels. As previously discussed, the claim that Lehi landed on the western coast of South America in what is now Chile can be traced to the teachings of the earliest Mormon missionaries in Ohio. When Cowdery declared in a public meeting in November 1830, that Lehi's party landed on the coast of Chile 600 years before the coming of Christ, and from them descended all the Indians of America. Although Chile will not be mentioned for another 21 years, early missionaries continued to locate Lehi's Landing in South America. Reporting on the activities of Lyman E. Johnson and Orson Pratt in Franklin, Venango County, Pennsylvania, in March 1832, one resident said they represented that Lehi landed on the coast of South America. Another report said they taught that Lehi came across the water into South America. In 1840, Orson Pratt, who later specifically named Chile as Lehi's landing site, published a statement similar to Lehi's travels, though with none of its specifics. Lehi's party were first led to the eastern borders of the Red Sea. Then they journeyed for some time along the borders thereof, nearly in a southeast direction. After which, they altered their course nearly eastward until they came to the great waters, where, by the commandments of God, they built a vessel in which they were safely brought across the great Pacific Ocean and landed upon the western coast of South America. In 1851, Apostle Parley P. Pratt was sent on a mission to the Pacific Islands and South America, which included a visit to Valparaiso, Chile. During this trip, Pratt published his proclamation to the people of the coasts and islands of the Pacific in Sydney, Australia, and began writing his book, Key to the Science of Theology, published four years later in Liverpool. Pratt's 1851 proclamation contains the earliest known statement published by a Mormon that Lehi landed in Chile. Lehi, declared Pratt, crossed the great ocean, landed on the western coast of America, within the bounds of what is now called Chile. In his popular Key to the Science of Theology, he wrote again that Lehi landed in safety on the coast of what is now called Chile in South America. Pratt does not give the reason or the source for the Chile designation. But it is unlikely that Pratt got his information directly from either the Williams or the Bernheisel copy, since they were both in private hands at the time. It is also possible that Pratt had reached the conclusion on his own. But more likely, Pratt confidently declared Lehi landed in Chile because he was repeating a strong oral tradition. Apostle Orson Pratt mentioned the Chile designation in at least two sermons, 
both dating to after the 1864 acquisition of the Williams document. Addressing a congregation of Mormons in Salt Lake City on the 27th of December, 1868, Pratt unequivocally declared the Nephite colony was brought by the power of God and landed on the western coast of South America in the country we call Chile. There is no indication that Pratt had seen the Williams document, although it had been in the historian's office for four years. On the 11th of February, 1872, while speaking to several strangers present who desire to hear some of the evidences in relation to the Book of Mormon, he explained, As near as we can judge from the description of the country contained in this record, the first landing place was in Chile, not far from where the city of Valparaiso now stands. Valparaiso, visited by Orson's brother Parley 20 years earlier, is situated about 33 degrees south latitude. Two years later, in 1874, Pratt prepared an article on the Book of Mormon for insertion in the Universal Cyclopedia, which included the statement that Lehi landed on the western coast of South America, not far, as is believed, from the 30th degree south latitude no doubt indicating that he was aware of the Williams document in the church archives. When preparing footnotes for the 1879 edition of the Book of Mormon, Pratt also included one that said Lehi's landing was believed to be on the coast of Chile, South America. Pratt's use of the term believed is not necessarily an indication of doubt or speculation, but rather, as Janie M. Sodal pointed out, an indication that Orson Pratt did not advance a theory of his own on this question, but stated what was held to be true among his associates, or some of them, as well as by himself. In 1880, two years before Lehi's travels appeared in print, George Reynolds, a general authority and secretary to the church presidency, stated in a church periodical called The Juvenile Instructor, the exact place where Lehi and his little colony first landed on this continent is not stated in the Book of Mormon, but it is generally believed among Latter-day Saints to have been on the coast of Chile. In fact, it is widely understood that the Lord so informed the prophet Joseph Smith. So far as can be determined, this statement is the first to assign the Chile designation to an inspired utterance of Joseph Smith. Although Reynolds made this statement one year after church historians examined the Bernheisel manuscript, and 15 years after the Williams copy was turned over to the church, it is significant that Reynolds does not refer to either document, but to church tradition. Most members were probably unaware that there was documentary support for their tradition, or that the church was in possession of two such documents. Yet, it is likely that the renewed interest in the Chile designation in the latter 19th century was likely due to these two sources. Prior to the uninformed assumptions made by later Williams family members, this is how these two sources were understood. The Richards Little Compendium had not included Lehi's Travels in its first edition, published in England in 1857. The church would not acquire the Williams document for another seven years and the Bernheisel manuscript for another 22 years. Lehi's Travels appeared in the first American edition of 1882 and every edition thereafter including the revised editions of 1914 and 1925. If Richards didn't know about Lehi's travels through the 1864 acquisition of the Williams document, he certainly became aware of it in 1879 or 80, when he and fellow apostle Joseph F. Smith made a careful examination of the Bernheisel manuscript. At the same time, Richards and Little were working on a revised version of their popular compendium, at the urging of the Twelve Apostles, which they finished in February 1882. According to entries in his journal, Richards had frequent contact with Bernheisel about other matters until his death on the 28th of September 1881 and had ample opportunity to discuss Lehi's travels with him. If so, it follows that Richards understood the circumstances of Bernheisel's copying Lehi's travels, and Bernheisel said nothing to contradict the idea that it was a revelation to Joseph the seer. After publication of Lehi's Travels, Mormons continued to comment on the origin of the tradition. In 1883, for example, George Q. Cannon, first counselor in the First Presidency, published The Life of Nephi, wherein he stated that the prophet Joseph, in speaking of Lehi's place of landing, said it was on the coast of the country now called Chile, and included the text of Lehi's Travels in a footnote. 
In his 1886 book, Questions and Answers on the Book of Mormon, Abraham H. Cannon, one of the seven presidents of the first Quorum of Seventy, and later called to the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, asked, Where does the prophet Joseph Smith tell us they, Lehi's party, landed? And answered, On the coast of Chile in South America. In his 1888 book, Story of the Book of Mormon, Reynolds repeated his earlier position, stating, The description given by Nephi of the region where the colony landed exactly corresponds with what we know of the country now called Chile. It was on its coast, the prophet Joseph Smith informs us, that the Nephites landed. He repeats this claim several times. They landed at a point somewhere near where the city of Valparaiso in Chile now stands, the exact place where Lehi and his little colony first landed on this continent is not stated in the Book of Mormon, but is generally believed among Latter-day Saints to have been on the coast of Chile in 30 degrees south latitude. In fact, the prophet Joseph Smith so stated. Perhaps aware of some questioning of this claim, Reynolds argues, We do not think it possible, without divine revelation, to determine with accuracy the identical spot where Lehi and his colony landed. Evidently, no one was questioning Joseph Smith's authorship only the revelatory status. In an 1889 article in The Contributor, B. H. Roberts, a president of the First Quorum of Seventy, repeated the widely accepted tradition concerning Lehi's travels, stating that it is known that Lehi's colony landed on the west coast of South America, 30 degrees south latitude. Twenty years later, Roberts found it necessary to question Lehi's travels, whether it should be considered inspired or not, largely as a response to challenges about hemispheric geography from critics of the Book of Mormon. As early as 1887, M. T. Lamb, assistant pastor of the First Baptist Church of Salt Lake City, published a book called The Golden Bible, which outlined problems created by reading some Book of Mormon events in the context of hemispheric geography as presented in the footnotes in Orson Pratt's 1879 edition. For example, the Book of Mormon's account of the Limhi expedition from the city of Nephi, presumably in South America, to the site of the Jaredite destruction, presumably in New York State, seems problematic, since traditional geography requires a round trip of about 6,000 miles, an altogether unrealistic distance, considering the group was looking for the nearby city of Zarahemla, Another distance problem is the movement of the remainder of Mormon's weary army and people from the area near the neck of land, presumably in Central America, to the land of Camorra, presumably in New York State, in preparation for the final battle. In Volume 3 of his 1909, New Witnesses for God, Roberts argued that if the Book of Mormon events could be limited to a small geographic area around the Isthmus of Tehuantepec in southern Mexico, Many of our difficulties as to geography of the Book of Mormon, if not all of them, in fact, will have passed away. At this time, Roberts offered no historical or textual evidence to support his limited theory. His only concern was apologetic. In a special meeting of the Book of Mormon Committee in 1921, Roberts and others discussed Book of Mormon geography. Referring to Lehi's travels, Roberts said to the others, if we were free from that alleged revelation, it would be easier to reply to adverse critics of the Book of Mormon. Thus, Roberts' motivations for questioning Lehi's travels were apologetic. Roberts did not doubt Joseph Smith's authorship of Lehi's travels, but he questioned its revelatory status. In his 1909 book, Roberts observed that the Williams copy of Lehi's travels lacked a heading that the words revelation to Joseph the seer were added by Richards and Little, who were justified, as they supposed, doubtless, by the fact that the paragraph is in the handwriting of Frederick G. Williams, counselor to the prophet, and on the same page with the body of an undoubted revelation, which was published repeatedly as such in the lifetime of the prophet. Roberts was merely guessing about what they knew, and was unaware of a second copy of Lehi's travels. Richards had died in 1899, and Little in 1908, and therefore Roberts could neither consult them nor could they defend their book. Twelve years later, at a meeting of the 1921 Book of Mormon Committee, headed by Apostle James E. Talmadge, according to Janie M. Sodal, 
Roberts discussed Lehi's travels and said a great deal depended on whether it is a revelation or not, and he did not see how that question could be decided offhand. Thus, he was careful not to flatly deny the revelatory status of Lehi's travels, but merely stated that the claim that it is a revelation rests on a very unsatisfactory basis. As reported by Sodal and Talmadge, the members of this special Book of Mormon committee were not unanimous about the book's geography. Willard Young, son of Brigham Young and supervisor over the church's building program, argued that Zarahemla was located in Central America in Honduras. Joel Ricks, who had visited Central and South America in 1903 and published several maps of Book of Mormon lands in 1916, argued for the traditional view, locating Zarahemla in the northwestern part of South America in Colombia. Others, like Apostle Anthony W. Ivans, offered suggestions, but remained undecided. As early as 1890, Mormon Apostle George Q. Cannon issued a caution about geographical speculations, since such discussions will only lead to division of sentiment and be very unprofitable. In 1938, the instructor reprinted Cannon's caution, adding that President Joseph F. Smith once refused to approve a map showing the place of Lehi's landing because if it were officially approved and afterwards found to be in error, it would affect the faith of the people. The instructor specifically mentioned Lehi's travels, incorrectly stating that the Williams copy was the only known source of authority and, like Roberts, expressed skepticism about its revelatory status, but also questioned Joseph Smith's authorship, observing that it gives no indication of the identity of its author. As previously mentioned, Sorensen questioned the Williams document based on the spiritual experience of Nancy Williams in the 1930s. In 2012, Frederick G. Williams III published a biography of his great-grandfather and included a slightly different version of his previous treatment of Lehi's travels, which repeated the conclusion that the secondary sources are of little use in unraveling the mystery of the statement's origin. Perhaps we will never know the full history of the statement. Perhaps not, but Mr. Williams' mystification was due to his incorrectly assessing both the content and dating of the Williams document, and not fully appreciating the historical context of the Richards Little publication and its probable connection to Bernheisel. He begins by questioning the tradition that Lehi's travel statement was a revelation, either to Joseph Smith or Frederick G. Williams, noting that it is not labeled as such on the original. True but the context strongly implies it. Indeed, it is difficult to believe anyone could twice give precise latitude coordinates without claiming some kind of revelation. Lehi's Travels was also twice included in documents containing inspired writings of Joseph Smith. Perhaps there was no heading or explanation because Williams and Bernheisel believed it was obvious. As discussed, Richards was intimately familiar with Bernheisel's manuscript copy of Joseph Smith's Bible revision, as well as Bernheisel himself. No doubt the 1882 title reflected Bernheisel's understanding of the statement that he copied into his manuscript during his contact with Emma Smith in 1845. So the assumptions of B.H. Roberts and Frederick III, that Richard simply assumed Lehi's Troubles was a revelation to Joseph Smith because it was written on a sheet with a known revelation, is incomplete. Frederick III also questioned Joseph Smith's authorship by repeating Sorensen's argument that Lehi's travels contradicts the statement that appeared in the Times and Seasons on the 15th of September, 1842, under Smith's editorship, namely, that Lehi landed a little south of the Isthmus of Darien, which I have already dealt with. He also repeated another of Sorensen's arguments, based on editorial comments accompanying two extracts from the 1841 publication of John L. Stevens, two-volume incidents of travel in Central America, Chiapas, and Yucatan, which appeared in the 15th of September and 1st of October 1842 issues of the Times and Seasons. The second editorial associated the ruins of Carigua, an ancient Mayan archaeological site in southeastern Guatemala, dating to the mid-6th century CE with Zarahemla, which geographically contradicts the previous article locating Lehi's landing and improvement of the country in South America. 
The writer comes close to identifying the city Zarahemla with a site in Central America, Frederick III observes. Although Joseph may not have written these articles, he was almost certainly aware of them. This is not certain at all. In fact, authorship of the editorials have been a subject of heated debate between advocates of the so-called Heartland Theory, which confines Book of Mormon events to North America, specifically the Great Lakes region, and those who advocate the Mesoamerican or limited Teowanapec theory, which confines Book of Mormon events to southern Mexico and Central America. The former advocates would rather Joseph Smith didn't link Book of Mormon cities to Central America and have argued that someone other than Smith authored the editorials in question, while the latter group have argued that Joseph Smith authored or at least approved of the articles associating the ruins of Kurigra with Zarahemla because they see it as evidence that Smith abandoned the traditional hemispheric geography by locating Zarahemla and the land southward in Guatemala. Both are wrong, however, because both assume Smith held a limited geography view, which is unlikely, since Joseph Smith and early Mormons were unaware of distance problems and therefore had no reason to seek a limited geographic area. The limited geographic assumptions of the Mesoamericanists and their need to view Smith as consistent with the Book of Mormon, have led them to misinterpret the Times and Seasons editorial. The Heartlanders have simply accepted this misinterpretation and feel compelled to escape it by denying Joseph Smith's authorship. Let me explain. In a 2005 article that appeared in the online Meridian magazine, titled, A Brief History of the Limited Geographic View of the Book of Mormon, John A. Twetness who served as Associate Director of Research at the Foundation for Ancient Research and Mormon Studies, known as FARMS, before his death in 2018, said the 1842 editorials in the Times and Seasons marked the beginning of the limited view of Book of Mormon geography. The limited view of Book of Mormon geography began in 1842, he asserted, when the church's newspaper, the Times and Seasons, noted the recent publication of a book by Stevens and Catherwood that chronicled the discovery of various ruins in Mesoamerica. And he went on to argue, since the city Zarahemla was situated in what the Nephites called the land southward, and the Mesoamerican region being described in the times and seasons is north of the Isthmus of Panama, the unnamed author seems to be suggesting that the Nephite Lamanite homeland was in Mesoamerica. Twetness here expresses the typical misreading of the editorial. But when one reads the editorial without the limited geographer's assumptions and reflex to make Joseph Smith consistent with the Book of Mormon, what the author of the editorial seems to be suggesting is that Zarahemla was located on the Book of Mormon's neck of land. The editorial, as well as another in the previous issue, associates the neck of land with Central America, from Panama to Teowanapec. The first article, which appeared in the 15th of September 1842 issue, simply points out that the ruins of Palenque in southern Mexico compare to Nephite cities described in the Book of Mormon, such as the city of Nephi, where a temple, like unto Solomon's temple, was constructed. Next, the author refers to the Book of Mormon's description of the neck of land, or isthmus, in Alma 2232, as if to say that these wonderful ruins of Palenque are among the mighty works of the Nephites, who built many cities similar to the city of Nephi, including on the neck of land. In this regard, the author states, They lived about the narrow neck of land, which now embraces Central America, with all the cities that can be found. In the second editorial, which appeared in the next issue of the 1st of October, 1842, the author does not associate the Book of Mormon's neck of land with the Isthmus of Teowanapec, as the limited geographers assume, but rather with all Central America. Central America, or Guatemala, is situated north of the Isthmus of Darien, and once embraced several hundred miles of territory from north to south. This echoes the previous statement associating the neck of land with Central America, which is also followed by a quote of Alma 2232 mentioning a small neck of land between the land northward and the land southward. Next, the author associates the ruins of Carigua in southern Guatemala with Zarahemla, comparing a large round stone with the side sculptured in hieroglyphics described by Stevens, with the large engraved stone mentioned in Omni 120. With such a parallel, the author could not resist crafting an ambiguous statement that would mislead those with a superficial understanding of the Book of Mormon 
into believing Zarahemla had been found. Without saying, Zarahemla had been found. It may be for this reason that the two editorials are unsigned. This statement reads, It is certainly a good thing for the excellency and veracity of the divine authenticity of the Book of Mormon that the ruins of Zarahemla have been found where the Nephites left them. We are not going to declare positively that the ruins of Corigra are those of Zarahemla, but we are of the opinion that the ruins of the city in question are one of those referred to in the Book of Mormon. Seven months earlier, in the British Mormon periodical Millennial Star, Party P. Pratt, a careful reader of the Book of Mormon, connected the Central American cities mentioned by Stevens with Book of Mormon cities such as Teancum, Desolation, and Boaz, which the Book of Mormon locates a little north of the Narrow Pass. Whoever wrote the Times and Seasons editorial was anxious to make a connection to the Book of Mormon without any concern about geographic accuracy, although I think it is probable that Joseph Smith either wrote or contributed to the article in question, it is not the decisive evidence that either the Heartlanders or Mesoamericanists make of it. So it really doesn't matter who authored the unsigned article, because it is unlikely that a new interpretation of Book of Mormon geography was being offered. While it is a common interpretation circulating among new geographers, the assumption that the second article located Zarahemla and the land southward in Central America is erroneous. As previously stated, Joseph Smith and early Mormons were unaware of distance problems and therefore had no reason to seek a limited geographic area. The author was being a bit disingenuous and overzealous in order to provide evidence for the Book of Mormon, not unlike what many apologists do today. Returning to Frederick III, his use of this editorial as an argument against Joseph Smith's authorship of Lehi's Travels is weak, to say the least. Even if Joseph Smith had endorsed the limited geography in 1842, it would not prove he had not authored Lehi's travels around 1830. Frederick III fallaciously reasons, If Joseph had received a revelation only a few years earlier, actually more than a decade, concerning Lehi's landing, or if he knew of anyone else having received such a revelation, it is unlikely he would have allowed a contradictory statement to be published. As we have seen, it's not really contradictory, but the assumption that Smith would not contradict himself is known as the idealist fallacy. In his book, Historian's Fallacies, historian David Hackett Fisher observes, a presumption of logical consistency is as unjust as a presumption of the opposite. In discussing the content of the Williams document, Frederick III observes that other than Lehi's travels, all the items on the front of the Williams document have something to do with translation, and then surmises that Williams brought together several items that were being discussed in the School of the Prophets, which was held at times in the Kirtland Temple in 1836, the same time as the dedication of the Kirtland Temple. The Lehi statement, then, may have been an idea discussed or presented by Joseph Smith or another speaker at the School of the Prophets and was an idea that Frederick G. Williams found interesting enough to jot down on the paper he had with him as he took notes in that setting. As we have previously discussed, the ink and handwriting on the front of the Williams document is consistent and does not support the scenario Frederick III asserts. Mr. Williams is also wrong about the probable date of his great-great-grandfather's document, which is based on faulty reasoning and poor attention to detail. First, he fails to appreciate the implications of his own observation that Williams composed his document after the April 1829 revelation, DNC 7, had already been published twice. Why would Williams copy a revelation that had already been published twice? He also fails to notice that the wording closely follows the 1833 Book of Commandments and does not include the substantial revisions of 1835. These facts point to a pre-1833 composition for the Williams document. Second, he fails to note that the anglicized Hebrew words, which he calls rough Hebrew, are not Hebrew at all, which leads him to assume that they may have been part of the Hebrew lessons given from January to March 1836. Rather, the lack of correspondence to Hebrew points to a pre-1836 dating. Third, he assumes that the common theme is translation, when in fact the common theme for all the items on the front of the Williams document is the Book of Mormon. 
not exactly a subject that preoccupied Mormon elders in the School of the Prophets in 1836. As previously mentioned, there is another common element that runs through the four items on the front of the Williams document that is not immediately recognizable, but Frederick III should have noticed anyway. They all relate to Oliver Cowdery, whom Williams first met in November 1830, and later that same month accompanied to the Missouri frontier. While the text of Lehi's travels cannot be linked to Cowdery, we know he was discussing Lehi's landing in Chile in November 1830 in Ohio. Given the convergence of these two common themes, that is, the Book of Mormon and Oliver Cowdery, together with the various clues regarding probable dating, it seems likely that Williams copied the four items on the front of his document during his close association with Cowdery in Ohio and Missouri. Cowdery and Williams remained in Missouri until the summer of 1831, when both returned to Kirtland, where Cowdery remained a few months before returning to Missouri in December 1831 without Williams. This is a far more likely scenario than the one offered by Frederick III. Locating Lehi's landing in Chile was only natural given the state of knowledge in Joseph Smith's day. It was known that the ancient Incas built magnificent temples at various locations in Ecuador, Peru, and Bolivia. See my video, Ancient Ruins and the Book of Mormon. The ruins of South America were seen by Joseph Smith's contemporaries as the beginning or ending of a long chain of ancient works stretching from the Andes Mountains through Central America, Mexico, the Mississippi Valley, and the Great Lakes region. Since many in Joseph Smith's day believed the mound builders were a single race of white-skinned Christian agriculturalists who met their demise in a war of extermination with the ancestors of the Native Americans in the Great Lakes region, they surmised that the construction of ancient works began in South America and gradually moved northward. See my video, The Book of Mormon and the Mound Builder Myth. The Book of Mormon, therefore, followed expectations when it described Lehi's colony landing on the western shore of the land southward, just below the chain of ancient works, which would necessarily put them somewhere in Chile. Chile is a long, narrow country stretching 2,700 miles along the southwestern coast of South America. It just so happens that Coquimbo Bay, which was known for its year-round anchorage and nearby copper mines, is situated about 30 degrees south latitude. In his well-known American Gazetteer, which went through several printings after 1797, Jedediah Morris wrote, The river Coquimbo gives name to the agreeable valley through which it rolls into the sea, and the bay at its mouth is a very fine one, where ships lie safely and commodiously. The soil is fruitful in corn, wine, and oil and the brooks bring down quantities of gold dust after heavy rains. Here are no gold mines, but plenty of copper. Another book by Amasa Delano, a narrative of voyages and travels in the northern and southern hemispheres, Boston, 1817, states, Coquimbo is in latitude 30 degrees south. The harbor of Coquimbo is a good place for a ship to lie. Gold and silver are very plenty in this place brought from mines in the interior and from those near town. In his Universal Geography, published in three volumes in Philadelphia in 1827, M. Malta Brunn states, The harbor of Coquimbo, 12 miles from town, is a tolerably large bay, well sheltered with secure anchorage and depth of water sufficient for large ships. The only trade is in copper and more precious metals. These are samples of what might have induced Joseph Smith to designate 30 degrees south latitude for Lehi's landing. After publication, Joseph Smith was known to occasionally fill in gaps in the Book of Mormon's narrative. According to one late account, in Blessing Reynolds Cahoon's Infant Boy in 1834, Joseph Smith named him Mahonrai Moriancomer, explaining the name I have given your son is the name of the brother of Jared. The Lord has just shown or revealed it to me. At another time, Joseph F. Smith, responding to the question about why the Book of Mormon is referred to as the Stick of Ephraim when Lehi was from the tribe of Manasseh, said that he heard 
from Apostle Franklin D. Richards and other Latter-day Saints acquainted with the prophet Joseph, that he explained that in a Mormon's abridgment of the book of Lehi, which supplied the 116 pages of manuscript lost by Martin Harris, it was plainly stated that Ishmael was of the tribe of Ephraim. The new geographers don't seem to have a problem with these insights, and they have far less documentary support than Lehi's travels. While there is no decisive evidence to establish Lehi's travels as a revelation to Joseph Smith, the circumstantial evidence is, I believe, strong, and the arguments against that conclusion are weak. Those who are not motivated by apologetic concerns have little difficulty accepting church tradition regarding Lehi's travels. LDS historian Lyndon Cook, for example, listed Lehi's travels among the uncanonized revelations received by Joseph Smith, and Hugh Nibley drew on Lehi's travels when he believed it supported his theory that the Lehi colony turned east and traversed the Arabian Peninsula at around the 19th degree north latitude. Thus far, the new geographers have produced no compelling evidence to overturn their own church's tradition regarding Lehi's landing in Chile. My message to them is that they should stop the weak apologetics and distorted interpretations of both the Book of Mormon and early church history. It's time to accept the fact that the Book of Mormon reflects the Mound Builder myth and hemispheric geography, and therefore is not a translation of an actual historical document. I'm Dan Vogel. Thanks for watching.